All right. Excellent. All right, I'm ready. All right, module number 11. We're making our way through to the end with four weeks left to uh, go through lectures. And then our final project and uh, the final is due along with all the other assignments. I'll talk about that after uh, the lecture, which won't take too long. As always, the picture of the week. All right, this will cover authentication credentials, beginning with what you know and what we've been using ever since we started implementing security into technology, passwords. They provide weak protection as there are several attacks that can be launched against them. The primary weakness center on humans. Are you surprised yet? Passwords place heavy load on human memory in, rem in remembering long and complex passwords, which are difficult for users to memorize. That's why they do stupid things like password one, password two. You just have to remember multiple passwords for different accounts. They should be unique to each account and some policies dictate it should be changed 40 to 60 days. This is why our users do those silly little things of password one, password two. In most password-based attacks, the attacker attempts to get a copy of the hashed password, then use various methods to figure out what the password was. Brute force is the slowest yet the most thorough method. Windows uses Land Manager still in 2020, still uses Land Manager, and New Technology Land Manager, or NTLM, still in 2020, to hash the password. It is actually very easy to create an NTLM hash, and you can do it in CyberChef. Uh, as seen in, in earlier modules, both are not secure, yet used in all Windows systems because backwards compatible, because Microsoft. Attackers don't need to crack NTLM. They can pretend to be the user and send the hash to the remote system to be authenticated, which is called pass the hash. So one way to fight brute force is to have a long and complex password. Because if you have a five character password. It's very, very easy to find. If you have a 13, it's a lot harder, although technology keeps getting better. So this keeps going down uh, with every new iteration of a processor who can handle, who can do more processes faster or more, or more processes at once. Passwords can also be solved by mask attacks which uses placeholders for characters in certain positions of the password. For example, if a mask started uh, with U and then a bunch of L, let's say one U at the beginning, one, two, three, four, five Ls and three Ds, that would mean we have a password that has a uppercase letter at the beginning, five lowercase letters following, and three digits after that. So a password like secure123 could be figured out with that mask. This makes guessing the password a lot faster. There are a number of sites, and I, I want to say one of them was a, a credit bureau that I encountered, where it was forcing me to uh, use specific characters uh, because it couldn't handle any and all characters. 
if I was an attacker, I would use that to create uh, my rules. Like, uh, like this, where I am more specifically saying, what should you use in order to figure out? These are even more focused using statistical analysis on the stolen password to create masks to break larger number of passwords. If the attacking system is, or the, the victim system is giving information out like, oh, this can only be, a password can only be 16 characters. Well, that's our limit. And then we can use human logic of using uppercase letters first, lowercase letters in the middle and digits at the end, you'll pretty much be able to figure out most passwords. Uh, there's also dictionary attacks that create digests of common words and compare them to stolen digest files. Dictionary attacks tend to be successful because they use, because users create the simple passwords like one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, Q U E R T Y, uh, password, let me in, like all this kind of stuff. This, this is all known by attackers and they have made dictionaries that you can download online and see the, those lists. Rainbow tables are large, and I mean terabyte big, uh, with pre-generated data to break passwords. Though rainbow tables take a long time to create, they crack passwords at a greatly reduced time. So you know how it, uh, earlier I had uh, this diagram of a 13 character password by brute force could take this long to crack? Well, if this is NTLM or LM, let's say, we could use a rainbow table that's already pre-generated every possible password known to man, including passwords auto-generated by, by the system with every possible character in every possible place. And it'll solve that in a matter of minutes. So as long as you have the hash and you have the rainbow table for that hash, cracking any length of password can be a piece of cake. Now, as you get you know, longer, your rainbow table may or may not be able to handle it, but for the most part, uh, they, can, they can crack the majority of, uh, of passwords that exist because people don't use really strong and complex passwords. The current best practice is to use a password manager so that users can have separate and unique passwords for every account that they have generating long passwords that have no pattern whatsoever. Some examples are Bitwarden, LastPass, Dashlane, 1Password, and KeyPass, although there are plenty more. I use Bitwarden, I have used LastPass uh, and 1Password, they're all fine. Uh, it's, it's really more of what, what uh, your preference is. I would say for a user who is not very technical savvy, LastPass is probably their better bet because it's more user friendly. Uh, but they all do the same job. The problem is educating people to using them, to understanding that it's not uh, it's password managers work different and they are safer to use. For example, with, uh, with a password manager, your, the, the password file is the one that, that is heavily encrypted. So if you're using something like LastPass and they have a, a website where you can log in and retrieve your passwords, if the website gets compromised, their passwords don't because the passwords are each individually sealed. 
so you can explain that a uh, uh, password manager website like LastPass, though it is as secure as they can make it, if the site gets compromised, everything else still is under lock and key. And the key being the, the credential that the user has. Moving on, that's quite a lot on passwords. And there is a lot because we've been using them and still continue to use them to this day as our primary way of authentication, which is why it's always under attack. And actually, before I jump that, before I jump to that, uh, I, I have uh, one of my books uh, that I that I can uh, point to. It's the Operator Handbook by Netmux. It came out not too long ago. It has a lot of information that is publicly available, but nicely curated into one book for you. The two main programs that are used to pass, for password cracking are Hashcat and John the Ripper, both uh, the freely accessible. Um, it talks. It has a section that talks about your core hash cracking knowledge. Again, stuff that everybody knows but you have uh, encoding versus hashing versus encrypting. Encoding is transforming data into publicly known scheme for usability, like base 64. Hashing, the one-way cryptographic function nearly impossible to reverse, but you can resolve. Encrypting, mapping of input data and output data reversible with a key. CPU versus GPU. A CPU has two to 72 cores mainly optimized for sequential serial processing. Whereas a GPU has thousands of cores with thousands of threads for parallel processing. This is why a GPU is uh, normally used instead of a CPU. You have the key space, which is the character set to the power of the length. So if you're using a 95 character to the fourth power, you have 81 million possibilities. Uh, your hash rate will be determined by the hashing function versus the hardware power. So if you're trying to crack a vCrypt and you're using a GTX 1080, it, it will do uh, 13,094 hashes a second. So in this case, uh, it would take in 6,220 seconds, it would work through 81 million different, uh, different hashes. Now, this is just one example. You always want to test with your hardware first. Because what one person gets and, and puts on their blogs doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly what you'll get. It has a couple of other uh, things that I just covered, like the dictionary, word list, brute force, rule attacks. Um, dictionaries and brute force are not the end all be all to crack hashes. They're merely the beginning and end of an attack plan. True mastery is everything in the middle, where analysis of passwords, patterns, behaviors, and policies afford the ability to recover the last 20%. Experiment with your attacks and research and compile targeted word lists with your new knowledge. Do not rely heavily on dictionaries because they can only help you with what is known and not the unknown. Cracking methodology that is used. Uh, the process would be number one, extract the hashes. You know, pulling the hash from the target, identify the hashing function, uh, and properly format the output for your tool of choice. Then you format the hash based on the tool's preferred method. Evaluate the hash strength. Uh, there's a table that uh, is in the book that you can use to, pro uh, to assess your target hash and cracking speed. If it's a slow hash, you will need to be more selective at what types of dictionaries and attacks you perform. If it's hash, you can be more liberal with your strategy. You calculate the, the cracking rig capabilities and you can use like John's dash dash test or hashcat dash B 
to see your results. You formulate your plan based on a, a basic cracking playbook, which uh, is on the next page and I can kind of go over that for you. Uh, so you formulate your plan, you analyze the passwords, you create custom-based attacks, then you can do advanced attacks and then repeat until, until you grind and find the answers. A basic cracking playbook that again is accessible to everybody is having custom word lists, custom word lists with rules, dictionaries and word lists, dictionaries, word lists, and rules, your custom word list plus rules, masks, hybrid dictionary and masks, custom word list and rules, combo, custom hybrid attack, custom mask attack, and lastly, when all else fails, brute force. These are all information that everybody knows that is easily searchable and in no way, shape or form kept from the world. There's a lot of sites that you can look this stuff up to. Now let's move on. So what you have, item number two, a security token will create a one-time password, a code that can be used for a limited amount of time. Tokens can either be hardware-based or software-based. A time-based one-time password or TOTP changes every 30 to 60 seconds. This is most commonly found in password managers and apps like Google Authenticator and in LastPass and Bitwarden and the others. HMAC based one-time password or HTOP change when an event occurs, such as entering a pin into a keypad. Smart cards use an integrated circuit chip that holds information and can be used for authentication. They can be contactless cards as well. Uh, these cards take advantage of certificates to verify the user. So something you know is a password. Your second factor can be something you have like a token or a smart card. A third would be what you are, biometrics. Biometrics uses a person's unique physical characteristics for authentication. They can be retinal scans, fingerprint scans, voice recognition, iris scanning, and facial recognition. The thing about biometrics is it is not foolproof. As every place where a user will authenticate must have the scanner and genuine users can be rejected while imposters be accepted. Biometrics, though it, it makes sense in theory, uh, the, the thing that you have to keep in mind is we change. For example, if you get a cut on your finger, the same finger you use to, to swipe to log in, it might not recognize that finger anymore because there's a cut. If you are sick, your, your uh, iris will be different and may not be recognized. Uh, you know, there's we our bodies do not stay uh, do not stay the same all the time. So biometrics should not be a a end all be all. It should be a companion, but definitely not something that you want to depend on as a second factor. Uh, 
Oh, uh, signature? You could do that. But uh, how often do you sign the exact same way? Or uh, voice? You know, if you get sick, your voice changes. Anywho, what you do, another factor, behavioral biometrics. Uh, this is another way to authenticate by typing something on a screen rather than remembering a password. It'll match your typing rhythm on the, and compare it to the one on the record. And if it matches or is close enough, it'll approve it. On the notes, I gave you a link to one that does this. Key track. It, it looks at how you type, learns how, uh, learns how you type. Do you type an S faster than you do an E? Do you type a, a J faster than you do a K? You know, it, it figures that pattern of how you type and makes that into the, the credential. So when you log in, it'll just, it'll just show you a phrase that you need to type. And when you type it in the way that you normally type, it'll say, okay, it's you and let you in. Not foolproof, but it is another interesting way to authenticate. There is also geolocation, where you are. Having a device like a cell phone to verify your physical location could also prevent an attacker successfully logging in if they're outside the permitted area. The caveat is it requires users to be okay with providing their geolocation to their organization in order to log in. So this could bring up a privacy issue, something that you'll need to deal with. If you wanna implement geolocation, this is something that you'll have to figure out how to navigate because you might have some unhappy users. Single sign-on. We are already using single sign-on. It's a federated identity management that allows you to have one username and one password to access multiple systems without having to log in each and every time. OAuth is another, OpenID Connect is another uh, that you can use to do this. So when you log into a, a Google uh, program like Gmail, you're able to navigate to all these others without issue, right? You just open another tab, you go to Drive, you're there, you go to your calendar, you're there, no sweat. That's, that is single sign-on at work. You only logged in once and now everything else can also log in. The problem with this is if, if uh, that account gets compromised, then that attacker could log in as that person and access everything. So of course it's not a uh, it's it's not a perfect fix, but you can at least have single sign-on so users don't have to log in all the time, and use a multi-factor authentication method like let's say the behavioral biometrics like the keyboard typing, or having a token, or uh, or geolocation or whatnot. You can use these other ways to complement and add more ways for a user to authenticate and ensure that it is the person who's logging in. And as always, you know, the more secure you make something, the more the less convenient it becomes. So remember that as as you think about uh, in securing your systems and uh, securing your organization and using something, uh, you know, using a, a stricter way for users to log in. 
Any questions? Okay. Remove these files over and make my share this. And hit record. Okay, so for your lab, for this module, you have another set of try hack me rooms. And as always, if the room is no longer available, you find another, another room that deals with uh, pastor cracking. And you'll, you'll you work on that. You do your little write up on your work and, and you get credit for it. Um, I do also want to cover some other items. Remember that you still need to attend Pacific Hackers, Pacific Camp, uh, Pacific Hackers uh, meetup, and OWASP as well. I did see an email. I think there is a session this uh, this Saturday for Pacific Hackers, and uh, I think there's a one on Friday for OWASP. Uh, but check the meetups, join them, listen in and write up uh, what you learned. Uh, there is a final project that has been sitting here. And now it's time to talk about it as we're nearing towards the end of the course. In the next four weeks, as a whole class, you will create a capture the flag. So you went through NCL, you know what that's like now. So now you will create one. This is where you as a whole class need to work together to build it. In the next coming days, I will give you the link to a, a Capture the Flag platform where you uh, will submit your questions. Uh, you will submit to Canvas a list of the questions you made and a walkthrough of your question. So you have the question, your answer, and how someone can solve that question. That is what you submit into Canvas. But what you'll do is you'll need to collaborate on Discord to create questions and post them into that CTF platform. And it can be on any subject that you like. So if you liked steganography in NCL, you can make steganography questions. If you like, uh, uh, network analysis, you can make PCAP files. Uh, if you liked forensics, you can do that or reverse engineering that, you know, whatever, whatever realm you liked, make questions on that. But you'll definitely need to collaborate with each other and use Discord to chat to figure out who's doing what and synchronize your work together. Um, I do want to remind you that the final is available if you want to jump ahead. If you really want to jump ahead, schedule yourself to take the Security Plus exam uh, next week, I believe. Yeah, next week, we're going to do a, there's a practice test that you can do to see where you stand. And if you feel you're doing well enough, I strongly suggest taking the test. The test, the Security Plus test is going to get updated, uh, not this, this coming, by the end of spring. So in summer, they're gonna change from the 501 to the 601. So you have these couple months to get certified before it changes. And at that time, you'll have to retake a class like this to understand the new content and be able to pass the 601. 
So I, I cannot stress it enough. Get certified before it changes. Ideally, you want to you want to get you want to at least take that test before the class is over. That way, the information is still fresh in your mind, and you have a better chance of passing it. So to reiterate, we have our usual try hack me rooms. Uh, you can already start thinking about what you're going to do in the CTF in a, uh, in a couple of days. I will release to you the link for you to create where you'll start submitting questions. Towards the end of the semester, you'll submit uh, this final project of either a, a docx or PDF of here are the, the questions I made, their answers, and how someone could solve them. For that project, heavily use Discord to communicate. It, I, it's going to be uh, an essential part in making a successful CTF. And as always, if you get stuck, please feel free to ask away on Discord. Uh, when am I giving the link? It should, I should be giving the link by the end of this week. Uh, minimum amount of questions uh, for the CTF. I mean, there should be, with the knowledge that we've covered, with the activities that you've done in both TriHackMe, NCL, and everything else, you should be easy, you should be able to create at least twenty questions. Any other? Oh, I um, almost forgot. Um, if you want to make your own rainbow tables, you could. If you have the bandwidth, you could down. You could torrent the rainbow tables. They are huge. I have a copy of them. Uh, and it, it is 12 terabytes in total. So if you want a copy of the terabytes, you'll need to send me a, a drive and I can copy them onto that. Or you could download them yourself, however you want to deal with that. But just know that it's about 12 terabytes worth of data. You know, if you want to crack passwords quickly, that's, that's about right. But the amount of data you'll need for every possible password. Yes, if you have a, a drive you want to send my way, then yes, I can, I can copy the, the tables onto them. Any other questions? Cool, if there are none, we can end the session. <laughs>